Hi guys. You will uh, notice that this isn't the normal podcast intro that I do. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily play the theme song or give bit intros or have Kristen and I bantering about different announcements. Um, this is uh, last week we took the uh, a week off of the podcast. Uh, there was things going on around the world, uh, and more specifically in the United States, that uh, sort of means that we have to leave room for those conversations to take place and for people to be able to process all of that information, including ourselves. Uh, but this week, uh, I did not necessarily want to take another week off because I thought it would be good for us to come back and to talk about different things. And uh, it just so happens that we have a great episode that I recorded a, a few weeks back uh, with my friend David Guthrie. And David is a uh, really interesting guy. I actually uh, he was my professor at architecture school a long time ago, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and he is a really interesting guy and has taken some uh, on uh, something that we thought was very appropriate for this episode, which is to basically address the issues of uh, people's safety during the pandemic and how he's going to try to help that through design and through his connections in the design world and in the fashion world and helping with people making masks and all those different ideas there. So very exciting uh, that David is doing that. I'm really happy that people are looking at what he's doing at that time. We talk a lot about my education and about where I came from, which you know sort of helped me become the person that I am today. And it was because of people like David who have helped me see a lot in myself. And I think that's something we can all do and give back to our communities uh, by teaching and by giving people uh, things that they need in their lives. So I really appreciate David coming on, and I thought it was very appropriate for him to be part of this. And uh, that's what I think we should all be doing, is helping each other out and doing a lot that we can to make ourselves better people, just like David's doing. Uh, so with that being said, hopefully you guys are safe and, and you are healthy, and you are also free to express uh, yourself in the way that you want to be uh, expressing yourself. So uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy this podcast with Mr. David Guthrie. Well, let's first talk about when we first knew each other. That Are you recording? Yeah, I'm recording. <laughs> uh, that was 93? Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, it was. <clears throat> it was my first year in architecture school, uh, and I was, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, I didn't know anything about anything. <laughs> yeah, I was a first year professor. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in the same boat. I was, you know, three years out of school, not even three years out of school. Right. Were you a and classmate with Shisha at school? She was a year behind me. She was a year behind. Okay. Right. Or maybe, I mean, it's a little confusing because I took five years to do the three year or three and a half year program. Okay. Um, I did two years and then I was in the Mark one like you. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and um, I did two years and then I left school to go work. Okay. To, to get some experience in the real world. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Sure. 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 I was pretty, um, disappointed or disillusioned with what I was being exposed to at school. Okay. To the point where I was thinking like, this isn't for me, maybe. Like um, architecture wasn't for you, right? Well, I mean, my whole life, that's what I aspired really? to do. It kind of, it couldn't, since I was like seven years old. And it, it was this idea that was constant. Um, I tried video and film production, which I loved and photography. But yeah. the, I had this nagging voice back there, architecture. You got to do architecture. Okay. And I originally had planned to go to uh, to study architecture as an undergrad, but I had this conflict with athletics. Um, right. You're a big swimmer. With swimming. Yeah. And, you know, it was something that was... I had never really done anything in swimming, but I it was a dream. Right. And so the plan was to go to, I was in Arkansas, went to high school in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I went to, uh, I decided to go to Hendricks College, which is a, a really good liberal arts college, tiny little school, mm -hmm. um, which did not offer architecture. <clears throat> and um, so the, I was going to transfer to the University of Arkansas. 
mm -hmm. in, in their program, the first year you're not in design studio, you're just taking general courses, pre-architecture. Right. So I'll do my pre-architecture at Hendrix, then I'll transfer. Okay. So it became, it got to be time to transfer, like after two years, and I applied, I was all ready to go, and then I was like, I just, no, I was, I think 17, no, I was 18 years old, uh -huh. and I could just see, I looked at the curriculum, it was all architecture, and I thought, that, no, I'm not ready to sign up for exclusively architecture, you know, right, for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I decided to finish at Hendrix, get a liberal arts degree. Yeah. And then at that point, I was kind of making a, a pretty big decision because I didn't know anything about the Mark I programs. Right. I didn't know they existed. So I thought, man, if you do this, you're going to have to start over and get another bachelor's degree. Right. But I was, I was just getting into upper level courses and I was loving that path. Mm -hmm. So with two years left, I had to come up with a major in a hurry, something that I could finish yeah what did you come up with i had <clears throat> what's well, kind of interesting my dad was a psychiatrist oh okay i'd been around you know psychology psychiatry my whole my whole life mm -hmm. and i had taken a few psych classes that i really enjoyed i went and met with one of my professors when i was making this decision like you know what what do i do so that i can finish on time mm-hmm and he said, well, what I would do, I would, I would major in psychology and do the minimum. And that, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I took him to heart. Um, that's exactly what I did. So it didn't have a very demanding uh, workload in terms of the number of courses you needed. Plus, mm -hmm. I already had a few. So it gave me the most latitude. The whole point was to take courses I was interested in and anything I wanted to take. Right. Um, so if I had picked another major, I would have had to load up on one thing, which mm -hmm. was that kind of, you know, monolithic diet was what I was trying to avoid. Right. So I picked psychology and then I, you know, just took things that I was interested in. Right. And um, it rubbed some of the other psychology professors the wrong way. Yeah. Um, because everyone Cause else was being serious about psychology and you're just like, I'm just getting this to get a degree. <laughs> I didn't go around broadcasting that. No, sure, yeah, sure. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't committed. And it, um, I remember clearly the award ceremony, my, you know, when I was about to graduate. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I went to one. In four years, I never went to the, the convocation for the for the awards right and I sat there while all these other people went up and got awards I got I mean I didn't deserve anything right I didn't do anything and I didn't like that at all it's like this is not going to happen again right so when I went to when I finally did go to graduate school mm -hmm. I went there with a mission you know <laughs> yeah um, and took it very seriously yeah well you took so, design very seriously I remember that very specifically. And I remember because I was, you know, I was coming <clears throat> from not dissimilar from you, right? Because I'm coming into architecture school and I and I, I knew about the 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 MR program. And that's kind of what my, I did up at design. It's like, yes, I want to be an architect, but I want to get a degree in other things as much as possible and learn as much as I can before I start to dive into architecture. And this was actually recommended to me by someone who was an architect uh, who sort of advised me as a friend of the family. He was a kind of a nice architect and he said, oh, you, that's what you should do. And so I said, OK, so, you know, math and architect, uh, uh, math and, and fine arts. And I did all that. And I sort of went into architecture school, say, let's let's make some buildings. I don't I don't even know what that meant, you know, and uh, and then, you know, just being in a <laughs> studio was a different idea. Right. Studio was a very. I was used to going to classrooms, learning things, doing homework, writing papers. And like, no, 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 you're going to spend eight hours in one room <laughs> every day. <laughs> and then you're going to be. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's uh, day. And then the night, eight hours at night. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just going to be <laughs> here all the time uh, and around your classmates and constantly making things. And I was very different way of thinking. And the thing that I think I remember the most about, about uh, talking to you and uh, Michael as well, it was you and Michael is that I had this thing that I needed to uh, 
you presented me a problem and I had to have a solution to that problem and that had to give a solution that was the only correct answer because that's the way I learned it in math, right? Like, here's the problem, here's the solution. And you're like, it could be anything, Chris. And then you just sort of made me think about uh, that process. As well as crafting, uh, uh, craft was a big, uh, a big thing about making sure that, you know, when I was drawing or when I was doing things, I was actually presenting my ideas in a very clear, concise, and well, you know, uh, constructed manner. Yeah, the process, the quality of the process is just as important as the final product. Right. It is the, a product, especially when you're in school. You don't realize the final thing. Right. In most cases. Um, but that is why I started the cube class, which was after you. I think it was I after think me. Maybe, I think I started that maybe that spring semester. Okay. Before. And then it developed from there for for decades right um 2005 i published a book 2004 2005 did you ever see that book no i didn't the little the little the little back black uh cube book with uh well explain to people what the cube book is uh, what the cube project was you know you kind of have to go I mean, we can go back as far as you want. Sure. To, to kind of, <laughs> we got lots of time. <laughs> um, you know, thinking about this, before we talk about that, I want to talk about our experience. Yeah. Um, because when um, when I finished graduate school, I was I had the privilege of opting out of doing a studio or a thesis. Okay. I was back in the day where you could you know, in your final semester, you, you had a choice. You could just do a design studio, you could do a thesis, or you could do an independent project. Mm -hmm. And I had gone off on a traveling fellowship for a semester. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I was ready to, to, do, to really do an independent project. Mm -hmm. um, the first week of school, kind of, I kind of took a step back and okay. I thought, you know, I'm dealing with so much stuff. I'm not sure if I should take on an independent project. I, I'll just jump in a studio. I'll just take the easy, easy path. And I had seen enough around the school to know all you have to do is show up that last semester. I mean, you could literally pin up a few pieces of blank trace and everybody would kind of nod and say, well, there's not very much here. And you get your degree. You know? <laughs> yeah. There, there weren't consequences at that point. Yeah. The, the work had already been done. Nobody was going to stop me from getting my degree. Right. So, um, I, uh, Peter Waldman was at the school and I oh, had yeah. never taken a, never taken a, one of his studios and I really wanted to. So mm -hmm. I jumped in his studio and I set up my desk and I just, I just couldn't do it. Mm. That, um, the previous year I had, sort of graduated from that you know mm. I had done the studio thing and I um, I was ready for something else so I I tried it I just couldn't do it and so I apologized to him I was like I'm sorry I just I gotta find my own path now that's mm -hmm. my transition from school to my professional life right um, so I, I decided I was gonna do a competition <clears throat> kind of fold a competition into my independent project and try to make some money. Mm -hmm. The Wood Institute had a nice prizes and prizes were great. You know, they let me travel, that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. So I did the Wood Institute uh, competition or that was the plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the way it's scheduled, you don't get to start on the project the first week of school. There's, okay. a, there's a compressed time frame for that project and it started about three weeks into the semester. So I had needed to do something for those first few weeks. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to kind of study joinery right. and I'm thinking that that's gonna, that's gonna um, find its way into this Wood Institute competition, um, the part in the whole, et cetera. Right. <clears throat> so I, I started thinking about making these connections, taking wood, making connections and, 
dovetails and you know beautiful joints mortise and tenon etc and um, thinking about Japanese joinery those kinds of things and it, it just didn't resonate with me at all because there was no context right. so it's like the <laughs> if you, it doesn't matter if it's a little I mean it's a paperweight right so I decided I needed a context so I got a chair a wooden chair mm -hmm. and my my plan was to saw it in half and then mend it with a dovetail like create this kind of zipper yep. down the middle and I got the chair like at a you know junk shop <clears throat> and first of all I had to find a chair that was worth my time okay um, it had to there, uh, the first the, the starting point <laughs> you know uh, let's say the, the chair or the final chair wasn't going to really be able to um, be better than the original chair right in a in a way um i needed the right context so i found a bank of england chair and really interesting i started to kind of scrutinize it and i didn't know where to start and i think that that's a really important thing in in architecture in any design project or process is to embrace that arbitrary moment right um could circle back around to kind of what you were talking about of being sure and knowing that that's the answer right well what's the question you know first of all what is the question and yeah. there's in every project there's the arbitrary it's the same in filmmaking right you just have to make a decision and go and and then you respond to what's happening right and you may have an idea but the, no matter what you're going to encounter the arbitrary right right and right. so i just em embraced that <clears throat> so I, I couldn't figure out a logic for how to approach this chair. And, right. Um, so that first one, I just, um, as I kind of studied it and scrutinized it, I found that there were, it appeared to be made out of like three or four pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. But if you look closely, each one of those was made up of, but disguised to look like a single piece. And so right. I thought, you know, there's a, there's a value judgment embedded in that, you know, but a large piece of wood, single piece is more valuable. Yes. Than a built up piece. <clears throat> um, it's things that we don't really think about are in the objects around us, you know. So I thought I'm going to I'm going to search for all of those suppressed joints and expose them. So mm -hmm. that first chair, I had no idea I was going to talk about chairs but um that first chair was all about disassembling it through those joints all of those joints and then reassembling it but right. when i put it back together it was offset everything was a little disheveled so it expressed that uh, all of those connections that had been hidden were now revealed right so there wasn't uh much added it was really just reconfiguring what was there and part of what the, the idea that, that kind of evolved from that was a, uh, that first chair is called the contrapposto chair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, contrapposto is that breakthrough in sculpture that went from the, uh, the rigid symmetrical form to the, sh the, the form with the shifted weight, where the weight shifts to one leg. Yep. And it sets off a series of counter moves. Your hips tilt and then your shoulders tilt the opposite direction right and it breathes life into the stone <clears throat> right so that was a, a turning point in in greek art and um the chair that i started with was kind of that uh that rigid symmetrical thing and i decided let's make that kind of the contrapposto the the asymmetry right the so i kind of twisted the chair moved the back so it it accommodates a um, uh, an asymmetrical seating position, it, it which is more real, right? Sure. So the what to me what was interesting was that the all of the components were still the symmetry was still readable was still legible in that object, but it was disheveled. Right, right, right. And then from there, I, I had I did three more chairs, and they involved prosthesis. Yeah, I remember. So I cut cut, a, cut away chunk with. Um, metal components that I fabricated in the machine shop. Yeah. 
and that was really um, kind of the the in a way the first work and needless to say I didn't do the Wood Institute competition that semester this right. other idea just took over right. <clears throat> um, and uh, it was it was very strange it was very polarizing in the school so for example when I left Waldman studio and I needed a I needed a space to work the logical place was to go into the thesis studio right and there's always students that are finishing up from the previous semester that are that are there and sharing sure. out. So I talked to one of them and she said, yeah, you can have my space. I'm out of here in a few days. Well, okay. I got called into the dean's office like, no, no, you're not going in there. Okay. Why? So they said, no, you're going to set up in room 215 in the corner by the sink. And I'm like, what? So I went up there and there was an, that semester, there was an empty studio okay. on the second floor, one of the undergrad studios, because I don't know, they had a small class. And so that was like the exile studio. There were two other undergrads that sort of rebelled against their, their studios and just right. set up camp. So in this huge, it was probably the largest studio in the school. We occupied three of the four corners. Okay. But it was just bizarre. Like, why couldn't I be... I wanted to be around other students and feed off of that energy and sure, sure, sure. have discussions and, you know, do my work. Um, so I ended up being isolated, except I had these two undergrads who were <laughs> kind of perfect roommates. They right. Were, they were they were awesome. <clears throat> so it was a great semester. Um, I kind of took what I learned. I worked at Morphosis during that, that time when I left school after after my second year. Yeah. I moved to L.A and worked at morphosis and i learned so I've much had, i've had tom main on this podcast <laughs> really yeah wow i'll have to check that out yeah, yeah he's actually he their office is actually like two blocks from our office in wow. uh, culver city so yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah i think about him often and uh um, i learned so much in, in a short amount of time working there and part of it was what we already mentioned the infusing everything you do with the same level of commitment yeah like that is your signature that's your identity mm -hmm. the working drawings like the the working drawings that came out of that office were gorgeous right and if you're touching those drawings you're serious you don't you know there's they're kind of sacred yeah and so everybody had that attitude everybody mm -hmm. that walked into that kind of into that culture um acclimated really quickly it was such a strange experience because um you know i only had two years of school mm -hmm. very little exposure to architecture and um so i started it as an intern and came in with the group for the summer and about a month or two into the summer they said so i had already decided i'm taking off a year from school okay um, i'm just going to stay out here and work so tom came to my desk and he said so you're you're staying this fall right and i was like yeah and he goes okay because we're thinking about putting you on a project mm. and i had started this thing called a a dreidel which was a hybrid drawing model okay so it became a series but i did the first one and it was okay. sort of this this house in santa barbara called the crawford house yeah it was insane so i was in the shop working on well First, I had to figure out the whole process, the whole methodology to do this drawing model. I mean, you you know their work. Yeah, right? yeah of and course. And this was in, this was like 1987 when yeah. it was pre-computer. <clears throat> yeah. So all of that stuff that they produce then looks like it's computer generated. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It, it was so prescient. Um, in fact, it would be a little bit challenging to do it on a computer now, but mm -hmm. it definitely kind of anticipated that. Right. But those uh, projections, the uh, layered drawings, multivalent, like plan and section simultaneous. Yep. And they really liked to, to use the oblique section. Yeah. Which is beautiful. 
So they were just sausage. The drawings the were <clears throat> works of art. I mean, honestly, the, yeah. a lot of them. I mean, and even when they started doing CG stuff, it was incredible. Uh, I've always admired them because they were so. I mean, there's obviously, you know, if you think about that, the, sort of the, the, the fundamental people of deconstructivism at that time, right? I mean, they're really, and they were all kind of right next to each other. You had basically the Frank Gehry, and you had Tom Main, and you had Eric Owen Moss, right? And they're all kind of right in that area around that time. It was Southern California. Yeah. Was ground zero. Ground no, zero no for that. No question side. about it. And, and, but one of the things that I always appreciated specifically about Tom Main and about Morphosis is the fact that, you know, coming from the CG side of things, is they looked when they started to take into advantage or realize what CG was, it was like a natural process for them. It was like, okay, well, now it's they just, were ready. they were ready for it. It's like, we'll bring it in and we'll use it as another way to express something. Uh, so, I mean, I think Tom even mentioned it on the podcast. Like, it's really easy to make a sphere on a computer. It's really hard to model one. So sometimes it's better to do it on, do the sphere on a computer, right? So yeah, do you remember the, the David Hockney work? I mean, we were kind of working in this mode when I was in graduate school mm -hmm. using the, the Xerox machine, the copy oh, yeah. machine, yeah, as, yeah. A, as a real creative tool mm -hmm. um, to do photo montages, yeah. um, to build up images, manipulate images. And David Hockney around that time did a, a, a bunch of work, uh -huh. like with fax, fax machines and, you know, printers and layering, mm -hmm. really using this as a, as a creative tool in ways that people hadn't thought of. And Morphosis was just like that. Like, whatever it is, we're maxing it out. Right. We're going we're gonna to max out its potential. So they, they were, were one of the first people to use <clears throat> 3D printers that I remember in architecture. And one of the things I remember they did is they did a, they did a, the 3D printer they used at the time was something called a Z-Core printer, which actually uses plaster. So it makes a 3D printed plaster thing. And they would print whatever they designed the computer. And it was like, but that wasn't the end. Then they would take it because it was plaster. They would sculpt the plaster itself and change it again but then this time was an analog as opposed to digital change <laughs> so it was really kind of uh, a cool <clears throat> amazing i mean they they did so much of what they did had never really been seen before mm -mm. like they did huge models yeah. like for the cedar cedar sinai cancer center mm -hmm. you could walk around I mean, the the model was taller than a person <laughs> yep and it came apart you know Yep. Um, they had the modeling pace technique. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? So they did, you know, they would kind of take one element of the model, like the structure, and make that a contrasting color, and everything else is completely monochromatic. Mm -hmm. With that kind of modeled, cloudy, beautiful, like uh, Venetian stucco kind of texture to it. Just gorgeous. They did so many things that influence everything that's come out. Right. Um, that was my salvation, you know, because I, I was at the end of my second or it was like spring break my second year. Yeah. And I was very disillusioned. You have to imagine um, 1986, 87, postmodernism held the high ground. <sighs> That's all everybody was doing and talking about. And I was like, I can't, I couldn't digest it. I couldn't embrace it. It didn't yeah. resonate. I, and I'm trying to, you know, you're, you're trying to do good work. And I had no real reference point. Right. I remember um, one, one visit to the library, I found a book that had some images of Frank Gehry's own house. And I was like, what? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting. And the, that spring, the MFA, the, Fine Arts Museum here in Houston had a lecture series that was the Southern California School. <clears throat> okay. So it was Michael Rotundi, who was uh, yeah. Tom Main's partner yep. and co-founder of Morphosis. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Moss mm -hmm. and Frank Gehry. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's Those are the guys. And so I'm in heaven. Right. It's like, that's what I want to do. That's okay. I can sink my teeth into that. Yep. I'm, I want to do this. So after Michael's lecture, I walked up and introduced myself and I said, Hey, I want to work for you. What do I have to do? Yeah. And he said, well, come out and interview. And the next week was spring break. So I quickly put together a portfolio and got on a plane and 
off I went. Right. And then when I was out there, I spent the week out there and I, I did interview with Morphosis and it did not go well. I, I interviewed with Tom Main and he just like, he took my portfolio and it was like a flip book. Just went. <laughs> and really look at it. And, um, yeah. and one of my favorite projects was um, something I did with shotgun houses. And, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I basically took this, took my cues from what they've done in Galveston, which is they treat them almost like mobile homes. Yep. Um, we should explain what a shotgun house is because a lot flood, of people may not, the, even Americans <clears throat> may not even know what a shotgun house is, but so, I mean, you have a lot of Europeans and stuff. It's kind of an unusual prototype of a house or, or archetype, I mean. Yeah, and I, um, it's interesting that you, that you, um, that you ask that because um, here it's it's just a given. When you're in the area of New Orleans, Houston, the Gulf Coast, it's ubiquitous. It's everybody knows what that is. But you're right. If you're not in this area, you may have no idea. Mm -hmm. But a shotgun house was designed for this climate, for the humid, swampy climate. Mm -hmm. So the houses are raised up off the ground. Um, they're not slab on grade. They're on footings on piers mm -hmm. and so the air can circulate underneath and they're just um, kind of a tube that's sausaged into rooms so it gets its name because if you shot a shotgun from the front door it would go all the way out through the back door right and it would pass through every room it's just a, a linear series of rooms a very very simple with no hallway <laughs> full yeah so the thing about them is they're they're linear which gives them a very small footprint in terms of the facade on the street they're they're tiny but they're long so they have a lot of depth but no width and what that does socially you know for for the urban design kind of uh, result of that is you get high density and they have typically have front porches and you have a little postage stamp front yard with a little three foot tall picket fence and these are all very, very important cues, and they were very important for the social life of these neighborhoods. Everybody lived on their front porches. It's a very kind of socially interactive arrangement. It's kind of what we're systematically erasing now as mm -hmm. we tear these houses down and build new. It's basically a garage door, no porch. There's no inner kind of buffer or transition from the inside to the street you're either in or out right so there's we've kind of erased the idea of life on the street or it's the kind porch. of <laughs> the front porch is gone <laughs> that's the that's yeah. that kind of mediating zone right where you are you're in the picture right you're you're you have a, a viewing platform in a way for life for life mm -hmm. for communal life <clears throat> And so, and even that little picket fence, I mean, you could step over those fences. So they're not security fences. They're, they're more conceptual. It's just right. marking them a little, a little boundary. Um, but it's not in a way designed to keep you out, you know? Right. So it's a very communal way of organizing a city. And it's one, I live in a neighborhood that's, bungalows you know in Montrose mm -hmm. so we still have a lot of these front porches but um, with air conditioning and television etc people don't spend much time in that zone between the front door and the street um, but it's one of the real blessings of this pandemic is that life is back you know yeah the, the other time I experienced that was when we had a hurricane come through I think it was Ike took out a lot of uh a lot of trees and a lot of power lines so we were our neighborhood was without power for 10 days and it was the best 10 days of the last 10 years it was amazing right how we just became a community because mm -hmm. you know you have no freezer your meat's going bad if you so everybody was grilling and by the way i haven't seen any of your uh, briskets lately. yeah i know i haven't been a brisket in a while <laughs> <laughs> um but it was great as long as you've got 
a bottle of wine and yeah. a grill. It was just a beautiful life. And, and I mean, there was one time it was sort of like a, in a way, a party every night, but not like a crazy party, just gathering mm-hmm. and having a, you know, this kind of social interaction. And we took a vote one night, you know, who wants the power back on? It's like, no, nobody. <laughs> sure enough, as soon as the power came back on, all of that kind of transparency, all the communal kind of life just got sucked back indoors and sealed off. Right. But, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that this pandemic is helping us reconnect with. Mm-hmm. It is certainly, I mean, you and I do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we're learning is how much we can accomplish sitting at a computer in isolation. Right. You know, it's not a time to despair. It's a time to get creative. You, it's amazing what you can accomplish sitting at your desk. Yeah. Just by by connecting with all of, I mean, it's basically a product of all of the relationships you've cultivated in your life. Sure. Now is, now is when the real value is really emerging. Um, you know, I've gotten involved with the PPE stuff and all of that is because of networking through trusted friends. Um, the people that you respect and admire and really trust is who you have to depend on. There's no time to vet. There's no time to build that relationship. So what we're doing is kind of literally networking through the solid relationships that we have, the people that, you know, the people that I know and have faith in that Mm -hmm. their relationships are solid. So if they vouch for somebody, then I'm good. And that works both ways. I've been introduced to to new friends through uh, common friends. Right. So it's like, you know, this guy's good. This guy's good. Right. And we just like immediately can lower our guard and get busy. Well, we, we can skip around a little bit, but I'll tell them a little bit about this this thing that you've been doing since this pandemic started. You started this new initiative and you're designing these new masks, which are pretty incredible, as well as other things, obviously. But can you tell a little bit about them and what this is? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like all over the place. That's it's fine. Crazy. This, is, this, is, this is, you, you are right on, you are right where <laughs> every one of my podcast guests should be is all over the place. <laughs> I just hope it's coherent. Yeah, yeah, it's um, good. It's coherent to me, but I have the whole, I have the whole picture. I'm you're just, you know. <laughs> taking pieces. Yeah. I, uh, so I train at Rice uh, for swimming. There's a master's group there, which uh-huh. is fantastic. And there's like, I don't know, two or 300 swimmers that train there regularly. Mm-hmm. And one of them uh, who is a good friend of mine is a ER nurse. And she recently, on about a year ago, moved to New York City. And when this pandemic hit, I was terrified of what she was facing. And right. um, also right when the lockdowns, so the wave of lockdowns started moving through the community, um, I moved my mother from Birmingham to Houston mm-hmm. in the middle of that, um, from one memory care facility to one here. Mm-hmm. and. Um, when I did it, they were both on lockdown. So it was extraordinary that we were able to pull that off. Wow. Um, yeah, it was March 12th. The, um, the, the place here in Houston, it's called Belmont village. Mm-hmm. They went on lockdown. Yeah. And I thought that I had, there wasn't a lot of urgency to get my mom moved. So to back up a little bit, I, I think I mentioned my, well, I mentioned my grandfather passed when I was in uh, graduate school, but my dad mm. passed in February this year. Oh, sorry. And we knew that, um, I mean, we were pretty sure that he was going to pass before my mom. Mm. And my mom and I are really close, and she always wanted to move close to me when my dad was gone. That okay. was always the plan. And she started having memory issues about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's been a very, very slow decline and it's again it's not a linear thing it's not an on off Mm -hmm. it comes and goes and you know last summer i i had one of the deepest conversations i've ever had with her 
Right. You know, at the same time, her short-term memory is, you know, it's not not there. Right, right, right. Um, but she is still there. Um, so when my dad died, uh, we started making arrangements for her to move to Houston. And she used to always say, I don't want to live with you. <laughs> right. I just want to be in a place like this near you. And I was like, Mom, we, it will happen. We will make this happen. And um, so I started looking for places and touring and all of that. And I picked one that I, there were a few that were great. And I picked one. We did all the paperwork. We were getting everything ready. And this was in the month of uh, last of February, first part of March. Mm -hmm. And we had paid through March where she was. So there wasn't a lot of urgency. It was like, we just need to get her moved before the end of the month. Okay. And I was trying to work it into my schedule too. Mm -hmm. um, also the doctor, uh, her primary care doctor originally recommended don't move her right away. It's too much, you know. She was still processing my dad's passing, mm -hmm. and to to make that dramatic move at that point can can just push them over the edge. It's too much. Um, so he said, "Let's see how she does, and then we'll, we'll, you know, wait a few weeks." So that's kind of also that was part of part of my uh, calculus too. So we had everything arranged and I was just getting, you know, trying to pick a weekend that I was going to go get her and bring her to Houston. And then Belmont Village went on lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. So th th this is really getting serious. Um, the worst possible situation would be for her to be isolated, you know, six, 700 miles away with no family right. around. <clears throat> and no way to change that. So um, I was like, I gotta get this done now. So I that was a Thursday that they went on lockdown and Saturday I went to Birmingham. When I arrived there, that facility went on lockdown. And fortunately they, they made an exception for me to, this is early on when everybody was like sealing things off. And we're talking about, you know, retirement home, yeah, nursing yeah, home, yeah. which are the most vulnerable. Yeah. Um, they made an exception for me to go in and out so I could pack up her stuff and load up her stuff. I have a truck, a pickup mm -hmm. truck. So I was just going to move her myself. Mm -hmm. And so we hit the road on Monday morning and arrived here Monday evening. Yeah. Um, there was a miscommunication and they expected me on Tuesday. So the, um, I wasn't on the list for them to let me in. Right. But fortunately we were able to navigate through that and I was able to move her in and, that night and set everything up, unpack everything and get her settled. Right. Because um, after all this time of anticipating her being my neighbor, mm -hmm. um, it finally happens and then I can't see her. Right. And I, I didn't know when uh, I would see her again. So, or be able to really visit again. So I had to make sure that everything was set up exactly, you know, the way that she would want it mm -hmm. that night. Anyway, um, just, being in that situation and seeing what was going on in Italy and uh, New York, I kind of, it, it, I sprung into action. I was like, I have to do something to help to protect my mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, and pr protect um, everybody there in that facility. Sure. So uh, this is when, you know, nothing was available. You go to the stores and everything was cleaned out. Yep. Um, but I went to a hardware store to, you know, do you remember Southland Hardware? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So it's a mom and pop. Like, they don't exist anymore. Well, <laughs> this one does. And okay. you can get anything there. So I went to get some little clamp or something. And mm -hmm. I walk in, and there's this little pile of disinfectant and PPE. And I'm like, what? It's like nobody thought to go there right? for that stuff. And then the guy said, well, I have some masks if you want masks. And so I got these. Um, I think they're called... N95s. P95s yeah. Yeah, yeah. P95s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. P95s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the respirators yeah, yeah. For, uh, for spraying pesticides. So they're like the highest filtration level. Right. And so I, I think they had four of them and I bought them and gave one to a healthcare worker, a, a caregiver at the facility with 
for my mom. And, mm -hmm. and then I sent one to my friend who's the ER nurse up in New York and mm -hmm. got a face shield and a few other things. And I was, I sent her a note and I said, um, you know, we're all behind you. The, the country appreciates you. Mm -hmm. In the days that followed that, I was looking at the TV and seeing these nurses, the New York nurses, just pleading for, you know, we're wearing bandanas. We have no PPE. This is crazy. You've turned your back on us. Mm -hmm. It was just heartbreaking. I was really ashamed, you know, the, yeah. what our country was was doing. And so I thought, I, you know, I sent one thing that's you know, not even a drop in the bucket. Right. So I thought, what else can I do? And so the, I thought I'll do a fundraiser or go fund me or whatever the yeah. kind of going blank on those. Uh, but I was going to do one of those to raise money to, to bring in a shipment. I found a, a supplier in San Diego. That's a medical medical device importer mm -hmm. where they, they work internationally all the time. They had a minimum order number of a million. So yeah. immediately I'm thinking, okay, we're swinging for the fences here. Why not? Right. Um, and that just got me into this whole world that I had never, ever been exposed to or really considered like supply chain um, and procurement, all of that stuff. So within a few days, I'm, I was on that White House procurement team list. Uh, Rachel Battle, uh, who, who was leading that, who got kind of thrown under the bus. Mm. Um, w we were corresponding. Basically, they were vetting everybody. And we kind of know somebody. Then you never got a call back. Okay. Um, but in those days, everything was changing dramatically every day. It right. was crazy. And I... So I had that connection with, um, it's called Perigee. Perigee is the, the importer that's based in San Diego and they had some connections in China and they're all legit companies mm -hmm. and we couldn't get anybody to buy. So we were talking to like the state of uh, Arkansas, some of these state governments and Stanford University, some of the other California big buyers and nobody would buy. And basically it's because it's all cash up front. Okay. They don't ship anything until it's paid for. Well, that's not, that doesn't fit the model of purchasing for any of these institutions. They hmm. never do that. I mean, you're lucky to get net 10. Hmm. So that was a big problem early on. Nobody, all this material was there and nobody would buy it. Meanwhile, it was a feeding frenzy. There were other people just bringing stuff in and, um, and paying for it themselves with the hope of, you know, making a profit, reselling and making a profit. But over the next, I don't know, week or two, the pandemic really went world. 200 countries suddenly were competing for this PPE in China. And right. you could not, there, there was no inventory. If you put your money down, you put your cash on the table, that would buy the next wave of production. Not anything that exists now, but you're buying future production. That's mm -hmm. the way it's working. And things have settled down a little bit since then. But I mean, I was just looking uh, earlier, I guess it was uh, yeah, the end of last week at um, a proposal for the state of Ohio. They were looking for bids for a large contract. And you know, none of this works. They're, they're kind of operating in the old reality. Um, and they're completely inflexible right. on their their terms and things like that. So we're just not able to make much headway on, on that side. But because I started getting involved with this stuff, um, I talked to a friend who uh, has a garment factory. And this is sort of by chance. I wanted to, he, he develops apps, or in the past he's been an app developer. Mm-hmm. And um, he was actually one of my students, briefly, okay. um, architecture students. He's from Costa Rica, and back in 2001, I taught a, like a two-week workshop there. Okay. And it was probably a dozen students, maybe a few more. 
and I have a handful of lifelong friends out of that brief workshop. Nice. Um, a bunch of the guys were surfers, and I was there for most of the summer. I went for a conference and did this workshop, and then I stayed on, stayed down there to to, uh, to surf. Mm -hmm. And when these guys were finished with their semester, they're like, hey, you know, we got finals and all of that stuff, but when that's over, let's meet up and go for, go on a safari. So mm -hmm. it's excellent. So like seven or eight of us hired a couple of little boats and went up to Ollie's Point, which is up on the Nicaraguan border. Yeah. And they just dropped us off and said, see you in a week. <laughs> and it was so much fun. But so we bonded, you know. Mm -hmm people in that group um, and a lot has happened in the years since then but that I had been going to Costa Rica since the early 90s um, but I was just kind of it was kind of hit and run I didn't have any real ties there but after that workshop I was connected to the architecture community and then I suddenly had like roots there I had a real social network and so I've sustained that all these years. And in the intervening years, I've bought property down there and have dreams of developing that and moving there someday. Hmm. But um, anyway, this guy um, uh, was, a, was just a savant, you know, just brilliant. And was always, I mean, there the, he was in the generation, this is 2001, so he's in the generation that trained in, uh, in, CG <clears throat> it's second nature to them and so he's very good at it and he's also very good at uh, putting teams together and managing teams of people that know more than he does so he's got kind of the whole spectrum of abilities as a designer etc and uh, anyway I reached out to him about doing an app and um, he had transitioned he, he used his skill in software to start doing visual. He, he built a visualizer for, uh, for online shopping. Okay. And we, this is like 10 years ago. We, we were working with a swimsuit manufacturer that's based in Mexico and design on their website. And so what, uh, my friend Derek, what he was working on was, a 3d kind of mannequin that you can map any pattern onto any suit pattern so it's an interactive thing where customers could see the pattern see the design in 3d rotate the model and mm -hmm. um, so he was early on in that and one thing led to another he started working for a company that that made um, made to order dress shirts and suits and he just kept evolving this software so now he has his own He's built his own A to Z software that is the website and all of the specifications you put in your dimensions, critical dimensions for your for your pattern. The pattern gets sent to the factory. It's all automated. It tracks all the uh, material inventory and cost and and these things are produced in a couple of days, like three or four days. That's amazing. And we're talking uh, like Xenia, uh, high-end Italian design houses hmm. are, are using his platform. Interesting. And um, yeah, it's amazing. So they're competitive, uh, you know, from a price point. Right. With off the rack stuff, if you can get it bespoke, that's amazing. So it's very, very high-end stuff. And this all factors into what I'm doing now because... Um, he, he has a factory in L.A. and a factory in Mexico. And in the past, he was working with a factory in China. And um, these are it, listening to your career it, or your path. It's it's a little bit similar, you know, mm. teaming up with for different projects with different partners. So that's what he's done. And now he's kind of circled back around to China. and He's working with a, an, an old contact there. And when I contacted him about doing the app, he was trying to figure out how to save his company. So he's got all these workers, two factories he's trying to keep afloat, and nobody's buying clothes. Nobody's ordering clothing. The garment industry is, is momentarily dead. Mm -hmm. So he's 
scrambling trying to figure out what to do. So he's pivoting to making PPE. So they started making masks out of fabric and uh, hazmat suits. And he was like, I have, I have this stuff, but I don't know where to sell it. And I was like, well, he was like, you have connections for buyers. So let's team up. Right. So we put together a website using his platform. It's called PPE Direct. And the, the goal was to get, um, to do a ground up, a, a, a bottom up approach instead of a top down. Because the top down distribution, you know, procurement and distribution was clearly not working. Hmm. Nursing homes were in rural places, clinics in rural communities weren't getting anything. So what we were trying to do is instead of worrying about these huge orders, let's just let people buy what they need and ship it direct. So that was our original model. So you could buy like 50 N95s and we would send them anywhere you want. We could ship worldwide from the from the uh, factory in Shanghai. And it didn't work as smoothly as we had hoped. The mm. rules keep changing. Now they won't even let, um, first of all, commercial flights have stopped. Right. And and now Trump has made it, uh, has prohibited uh, the carriers like UPS and FedEx from shipping PPE. So really? We can still get it. We Yeah. So we can still do it. We can still ship, but not through those carriers, not through regular flights. We can ship on charter flights. So everything that's coming over now is being shipped on charter flights. Huh. I mean, it's just an ever-shifting landscape. And it's like trying to see it through a keyhole, you know, when you're right. here. But um, we've covered a lot of ground. We've gone through a learning process. You know, the one of the first things that I ran into was the first charge on the credit card had a two-week hold on the payout. I... I didn't know anything about that. I'd never done this before, but that's standard for a new company. Mm -hmm. Well, two weeks is just killing me. You know, I didn't have the money to just send the money to China and then get reimbursed myself. So I had to wait for the payout. So there were a couple of other things that happened. Um, like by the time the money came through, then they were back ordered, and then there was a Chinese holiday for five days. <laughs> right. Anyway, the first the first products have been delivered. So that's a to me that's a big success. Like okay, we we survived, we, we ran the gauntlet and we landed material here in this crazy environment. Right, right, right. It's gonna get easier now. It's, it's, we can get stuff delivered in about, in, in less than two weeks. Hmm. And about half of that time is product sitting in Hong Kong, waiting for a flight, waiting for to get on one of these charters or waiting for the charter to fill up. Right. Um, so one of the things that we've done, um, the the factory in China made these designer Italian suits and they're super high quality. They're, this factory has been around for, I don't know, 17 years now mm -hmm. and acquired the skilled workers. And I know they have 450 different types of machines and, you know, they have one person that just is in charge or maybe more than one, but that's all they do is they're in charge of machines. The mm -hmm. factory owner doesn't know about the machines. It's way too much. Right. Um, but they, half of the, or part of the factory made suits and part of the factory made dress shirts. And so they pivoted to try to survive, you know, because nobody's ordering suits now. She doesn't want to, the factory owner's name is uh, Xiao Mei, and she doesn't want to lose her, her, uh, employees and you know she she genuinely cares about them as well and so she started making hazmat suits in the area that made uh dress suits and converted the shirt making part of the factory to making uh, fabric masks so she's making masks out of this organic albini cotton they're gorgeous and we just got them tested uh, lab tested mm -hmm. and we also are bringing in some uh, pharmaceutical grade filter fabric from Turkey. It's the only place where it's manufactured. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I think they make 50 metric tons a month and she's getting three ton, three metric tons of that material. Mm. 
So these are going to be kind of hybrid. They, they, we might even go for FDA mm. approval. But she's super creative, and um, she was educated in the United States. So the culture uh, isn't a barrier. The language isn't a barrier. And we're just trying to to add value and kind of have it be a win-win where her her factory stays open her, her workers are doing something they care about and we influence what's happening in a positive way right so we'll be able to do custom anything we can do anything she said david you've got a factory in china behind you what do you want to do wow it's like uh <laughs> okay okay that's a dream come true but the, one of the first things we're doing is focusing on the masks right and we've got like several different designs we've got them for kids um what we're going to start doing is really making them available to companies who want to have or universities where they can have their uh, brand identity their logos etc their colors anything they want we can do any anything that you want to do we can do heat transfers or direct printing right um and thousands of fabrics available to choose from nice so we'll see i mean we see this as a transitional thing Mm -hmm. um it's not a long-term move it's something for now and to 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 get us through this to the next thing but it's also a way to i mean look there the masks are such a complex thing socially yeah and if we can do something you know part of what's going on is um they're anonymous they're clinical right um or they're homemade and maybe not great or not effective or not healthy even Mm -hmm. you know i don't think that you don't want to be breathing through polyester you don't want that on your face um if you can have something that expresses your identity while it's covering your face that's a that's important yeah um you know it's about personal expression and so maybe we can you know it'd be great if we could move the needle a little bit on that well, I so. thought it was a brilliant, brilliant idea, and I think that was the. I mean, you and I have been chatting on Facebook, et cetera, for a Facebook. while. But uh, when you started talking about these masks, I was like, "That's really cool," because you know, obviously, I mean, you've always been a designer, designer. Like, you're one of the most design person I know. And when you always look for opportunities to design, and and it doesn't have to be about. Uh, uh, architecture it has to be about a the need of something right or the way it need, uh, the way that it fruits through and so you always you looked at this problem and you knew you had to deal with it and you basically said i can do this and you <laughs> that's pretty amazing what you you're not just you didn't just design this you created an, an entire infrastructure from factory to deliverable systems <laughs> all in one Look, really in a very ro- short time <laughs> robust yeah robust and our uh, so our, our company name is luxington mm-hmm. so we have luxington Shanghai and Lexington, Houston now. Mm-hmm. And our, our tagline is do well by doing right. Right. Which I firmly believe and all of us do. And so as we put all of this together, as we build the team, that's sort of the litmus test. Like, what are you in this for? Right. I mean, we do have to take care of ourselves. I've got bills to pay. You yeah. Know, I'm not a nonprofit. I'm not pretending to be nonprofit. Right. Um, but I want to I want to contribute. I want to help. And when you start taking care of other people, um, amazing things happen. Yeah. It's true. If you're if you're in it for yourself, it's very uh, it's a dead end. Man. It's a dead end. It doesn't matter what you achieve. Uh-huh. It's empty in the you know, in the final analysis. And I've really t- embraced this transformation or this uh you know, we're in a liminal period now. Mm-hmm. The, the old system, the old world is is over and we don't know what the next one is. Right. And that's that is the definition of a liminal time. Right. It's it's the time before the next thing. Right. And I am loving it. I mean, I feel a little guilty about saying that because I know there's a lot of suffering. And but look, I'm embracing my I'm suffering, too, and I'm embracing that. Mm-hmm. in a way that i had never really have before yeah um i used to think you know it's very important to be uh 
thankful to have grat out of you know to be to have gratitude as one of your principal values and to practice that. And my mom, it's one of the things that she always would preach. You know, just be thankful. Because look, man, the path that I've taken has been hard, hard. Mm. I've been a self-employed designer in my whole career. You know, the <laughs> yeah. last the last time I worked in an office was uh, 1988. Right. You know, when I got my degree, I just you know struck out on my own, and yeah. uh, and I've you know I've made it this far without. Um, uh, you know, interruption. Yeah. And that's a, t you know, in any creative field where you're making your own path, it's a tough one, whatever it is, artist, musician, yep. writer, uh, the, the odds of success or, you know, financial stability are pretty low. Um, there's usually the day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I, I think mean, teaching helped me for sure. Yeah, yeah. Teaching is teaching is really a good thing. I mean, honestly, there's several things that I've learned. I mean, I was teaching at Rice uh, briefly as well after I graduated because I was one of the guys who knew the most of the software the that was being used over there yeah. <laughs> that no one else knew how to use. So I was like, yeah, hey, Chris will do it. So and it was actually what was interesting about Rice. It was not uncommon for recent graduates to become teachers there it was actually it was actually kind of hard to leave the school because you sort of became part of it and part of that facility and i you know I, i'm not an architect anymore i haven't been an architect for a long time even though my mother still calls me an architect because she doesn't understand what i do so she still calls me an architect <laughs> but uh i was like did you ever get licensed no, no. I was at Gensler, and then the first thing I did at Gensler is they made me in charge of all the 3D and the computer stuff, of course. So then I was like, well, that's what I do, I guess. Um, but I, 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 you know, teaching was a big thing for me because teaching allowed me, you know, if you teach something, you really got to know what you're talking about. And so therefore, you start to learn a lot more than you think you did, uh, than you think you knew about it uh, by doing that. But honestly speaking, uh, you know, another reason we were talking about uh, being on this podcast is that you have an idea of starting a podcast as well, which I think is a great idea. And I figured, why don't you come on this podcast and you can see what it's like and then you can use that. But doing podcast itself has been a huge thing for me because I learned so much from so many people. And the other thing that's incredible is I learned just like I like, just like it's happening today. I've known you for a long time, but I learned a lot more about you just because of the opportunity of you talking. So uh, there's a great opportunity mm -hmm. to learn from people by, by conversation and, and just finding out more about stuff. So, Yeah, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Yeah. I mean, this is, look, I've wanted to start a podcast for a couple of years. And yeah. even before, you know, I wasn't even following any. It's just something that I was interested in. Uh -huh. um, and, and really, I was thinking about swimming. There were swimmers that I wanted to talk to, okay. especially, you know, it, older swimmers. Like, how do you how do you do it? <clears throat> right. Um, but it's evolved into so much more than that. And now in the just in the last few weeks with this time, I've started listening to podcasts and I'm just addicted. Yeah. I'm addicted. There's some great ones out there. Oh, there's a lot. Like, yeah. I, I love the Rich Roll podcast. That guy is somebody that I really identify with, really resonate with. OK, I don't have the alcohol uh, but I'm familiar with it um, uh -huh. you know my brother has struggled with that his whole life and um, so I, I can relate but also we all have addictions we all have patterns sure of self-destructive or negative behaviors and um, this this medium is fantastic I love the the time to have an in-depth conversation yeah you know and I, I feel like this uh, this conversation has been all over the place and i kind of that's great apologize I, don't apologize I, that's the best part um, <laughs> there were well there were there were some ideas we sort of didn't get to i'll get back but, to um, them i'll get back to them uh the i remember so um there was a uh uh someone who's a neighbor of ours and uh his uh his son um uh and my son were actually good friends but it turns out that this guy 
uh, is, uh, his name is Wayne Knight, and he's the actor who plays Newman on Seinfeld, if you remember that, or he's also in Jurassic Park, mm. et cetera. So he's a really, really charismatic guy, really fun. And I got to know him, obviously, because our, our kids are friends. And my, my, you know, this is when they were little, so my son mm. had no idea who his dad was. He just, like, he just liked his house because he had a really big house. Uh, but um, so we were hanging out, and, and they were talking stuff, and I talked to Wayne, and I said... I heard you on the uh, on the Nerdist podcast. And he goes, yeah, I was on the Nerdist. It's like I hadn't been on a podcast and I'd never been on a podcast in my first time on. I said, yeah, it was really good. I learned so much about you. He goes, you know, Chris, what's interesting is that I do a ton of interviews for, you know, whatever movie or sitcom, or whatever. And they come in with these junkets and they're like, you got three minutes to say the same sound bite for everything. And they're like, oh, yeah. I've got one story and it takes 30 seconds. So you, you prep that one story. But in a podcast form, he said, suddenly is like, I told my entire life story in an hour and a half. And then suddenly like, people know way more about me than they've ever <laughs> knew. I was like, yeah, exactly. That's what I thought was so cool about it. Yeah, including me, I was listening to your, your you were a guest, uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Mc, McAlley? McAllen? Uh, Alan McKay? McKay, yeah, Alan McKay. Yeah. So, I mean, some of it I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because it's such an insider kind of shorthand. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But a lot of it, I, you know, it was very cool to get that perspective on you and what you've done. And, I mean, obviously you've been amazingly successful and are, you know, in the thick of it. Um, and have just you know parlayed one thing into the next. It's just it's very cool. Well, I think to see what you've done, but it, it but it's great to hear the podcast. That's I mean it's two hours long, right? Right. Something like that. And yeah. there, there's just all kinds of great stories and tidbits and stuff. Some of it's about a lot of other people you've encountered, and sure, you know, some of it's just personal. It's uh, it was it was cool because I was just looking for more CG garage podcasts. Right, and I stumbled on stumbled onto yours. Oh, onto the Alan one. And, yeah, actually, re- interesting. I was I just recorded another one with him, and so it's going to be on again. And uh, I don't know whenever he, he he releases his, but it's a, uh, what's also interesting is uh, honestly is uh, there's a guy who uh, who I've met a few times. He's a really nice guy. He's and uh, he, he and I go to the same conference. And he gets, got on the, he says, I need to talk to you about something technical. So he has some technical problem I need to solve. And I got on the phone with him and he goes, you know, it's weird, Chris. It's like, I feel like I know everything about you and therefore you're like a really good friend of mine. But you're like, you don't really, I realize that it, all of this information I know from listening to your podcast. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's a little awkward. But uh, anyway, it was fun. Uh, definitely fun to do that. But uh, I do remember one of the things we talked about that we kind of like uh, lo- left open ended was the the cube book. Let's talk about the cube yes, book. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I remember okay. the, the chair was one thing, uh, and I remember I remember looking at pictures, chairs, and we'd love to have pictures of them to put up on our on our on the podcast page. But you you created another part of a, a design exercise that involved a cube, right? Yes. So before we leave the podcast thing, yeah. Um, thank you. Because this is, this is, you said we can kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> this experience has been such a springboard for me to mm-hmm. learn what it is and how to do it. And I mean, I, I don't know how to do it yet, but I know how to set up to be a guest. Yeah. Just going through that exercise has moved me much closer to making this a reality. So thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Um, it's just great. So I'm, I'm on my way. I'm going to do this. I've lined up a couple of guests already. I'm really excited. So. Perfect. Well, I will help you set up like all the technical things and where you need to do, where you do your RSS feed and all of that information. There's stuff that you can, I can help you out with. It's not a problem. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the Squadcast, just learning about Squadcast. Squadcast is like, new. I learned no about this idea. because of the pandemic. I'm, like I did, because I always did them in, per, in person. So I was like, oh, this is great. Squadcast is is the perfect tool for me right now. And I'm, I'm going to continue backup, using it. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So I'm learning from the master. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we all need that. And I think that that's a big part of what's going on now so that we can really help each other, you know, and advance things in a way that we weren't open to before. Sure. I'm, my old life is gone. We're completely embracing that. Mm-hmm. 
completely. I'm so ready for things to be different. So um, to go back to the cubes, it, it does kind of go back to the chairs because one of the things that was really important about the chairs was it wasn't a model. It wasn't a abstraction. It wasn't a drawing of something that would never be realized. It was the thing itself. And I was treading in some kind of treacherous territory because I don't like uncomfortable furniture. I don't like art furniture. <clears throat> and around that time, art furniture was a big thing. And it's just sort of, to me, it was like a way for people who weren't good enough artists to kind of dip their toe in that world. And mm -hmm. then craftsmen that weren't very good craftsmen could get away with crappy crap by calling it art furniture. <laughs> um, sure. It just was compromised. And it just, you know, I don't like to trivial. So one of the, when I started on that project, one of the things that, uh, the imperatives, I didn't have a lot of rules, but one of them was the chairs have to be more comfortable, at least as comfortable or more comfortable and functional when I'm done with them. Mm -hmm. as they were when I started and they look terrifying you know I had, there's especially one of them it's all metal kind of wrapping a, a child's chair and um, it looks like a bear trap or something I had to beg people to sit down in it it's very comfortable but it's like no thanks um, yeah to carry that story to the conclusion it, that that group it's a it's really a body of work four chairs that create a they're each like a sentence that creates a paragraph right so they belong together the together there's a kind of a narrative that they don't communicate individually and that that group got bought by um, the sf moma mm. so they're in that permanent collection and they've been shown a few times um so what's a little frustrating is once they're in a in a museum environment, then nobody can sit in them anymore. <laughs> so I, I can't convince people that they're comfortable. Right. But, um, anyway, I, I was really um, intent on making the thing itself. So I, in, in our architecture curriculum, that was kind of uh, a missing component to me that we spent so much of our time working in abstractions that never get realized. And some of the way that Morphosis dealt with that was to invest so much in the process and the material of production that it almost didn't matter if the thing was realized or not. You have this body of work that's amazing and sure. it runs parallel. It has the same kind of, in a way, the same kind of gravity as the final product. So that first year that I was teaching, I wanted to do a, um, uh, it was a, an elective, a three hour course that was called Methods of Making. And it was about direct interaction with materiality and making the thing itself, not making a, a model, but it's the thing. So some of this was just maybe intuitive, but some of it was kind of blind luck. Um, the first year that I taught it, uh, it was the, the program, the was a 16 inch box made out of wood and you could introduce other materials to it and it had a drawer so it's sort of almost a surrealistic or surrealist uh, component to it mm -hmm. and it produced some really amazing work but it also didn't accomplish what i was trying to which was to really re be super reductive and get down to the nitty gritty of every single decision and the consequence of every decision you make that it's registered there in the materiality of the thing right is is it coherent or is it not and so in architecture school it's easy to say something and equate that with doing it <clears throat> and there's a huge gulf between the two mm -hmm. um, but you know if you say it and you can say it eloquently it's convincing and people think that you've done it and you can convince yourself you've done it but um, I wanted to kind of create a situation where you couldn't do that, where the thing had to speak for itself and it, it either stood or fell on its own merit um, by what it could say, what it could communicate without anybody explaining it. And 
that first exercise with the drawer, it kind of let, it, it allowed too many escape routes. So the students were really conceptualizing um, and not really dealing with the details, the construction, the kind of the way things are really assembled in those details mm -hmm. because it was about an idea, an, an idea that was kind of attached to this thing instead of something that was emanating from the thing. So I had to revise that even though I liked that project, I said, okay, I got to cut off all escape routes. So we ended up doing, um, there's three versions of the exercise and the first one is two by fours. So you just use typical two by fours and mechanical fasteners and you construct a cube that's 16 inches. Hmm. And the only real rule is um, no chemical fasteners are allowed, no glue. So you, okay. have to, you can do any kind of fastener that you want. You can create your own or whatever. Um, or you don't even need a fastener if you can figure out how, to, how something can kind of interlock and hold itself together. Mm -hmm. And then the next iteration is, um, I mean, so one of the things that you have to resolve is a two by four is a directional material. It right. has a grain to it, cross section, et cetera. Um, it's fine when you kind of make a, a two dimensional corner, but then when you add that third axis, things get complicated. Right. So there's a complexity built into it and a kind of asymmetry suggested by it. Um, and these things ended up being like snowflakes. There's so many ways to solve this mm -hmm. um, and so many beautiful ways, right? And the, each one, you basically have to, you have to construct a language. There has to be a logic that carries all the way through it. So every time you make a connection, turn a corner, it has to be resolved and that has to feed to the next corner and be resolved. And the whole form has to also be resolved. And when those things are in, in sync when it's all in dialogue, it's stunning. And maybe one of them itself, um, kind of like a snowflake, maybe it's it's beautiful, but when you see a whole array of them and you see them all together, but when you see them as a collection of, of variations on this theme, they're really stunning. The next iteration is um, to add a skin to the, to the frame. So these are basically like a, a frame that's open. Okay. And so we enclose the frame with plywood and drywall. So I was trying to introduce uh, just this interaction with the materials that you're going to be dealing with when you start practicing, when you start building. Mm -hmm. These are the ubiquitous things. Two by fours, nails, screws, wire, drywall, plywood. And so how do you turn the corner? How do you negotiate how these things uh, meet each other? And um, how do they communicate? How is that all resolved? And so the, the exercise is you have to, you know, it's a six sided form. So you have to cover five sides and leave one side open. And then you have to use two materials. So it's, it automatically introduces asymmetry to it. So it can't be just kind of a reflex. Right. And you've got complexity built into it. And then the third one is a real departure. And that was basically a 16 inch solid that you have to put two materials in a dialogue to create a solid block. And the idea is that anywhere you cut a section through that cube, through that solid, it would it reveal would be that solid. relationship. Right. It would be solid and it would also tell you something about that dialogue. The dialogue between those two materials would, Got it. would resonate and make sense. And um, that one is like a curveball because you've already gotten kind of assimilated to this process, a way of thinking. And then this is like completely different. The solid one. It's, it's like poetry in a way when you've been, you know, writing nonfiction. Right. <laughs> and um, so it, I've tried it in different sequences. And um, actually, I taught a semester, I taught a fall semester at the University of Houston, and we did uh, cubes. Right. As a studio project. And I hadn't, uh, I hadn't taught since 2007 been a long hiatus um, and I got invited to teach and uh, I don't know if you know um, 
uh, Gail Borden. Yeah. Yeah, he was a uh, he was tenured at USC. He was yeah. a, he was like one of my students in ninety three or four. Yeah, early yeah. On he was a sophomore studio. He was one of those students where it's like you just stay out of the way, try not to screw them up. Yeah, yeah, I and, remember. You know, I I, I want to say this. I wish I had done that with you. Um, you know, I didn't. I'm not a mathematician. Right. I didn't. Um, we'll have to talk about that a little bit. But, um, <laughs> you know, they the the politics and everything and the whole experience of being thrown into that studio with Michael. Yeah. Um, it was hard for everybody. Um, you know, because he had expectations. He was going to teach his own studio. He came in with Lars. Yep. And I came in with Lars. And the way that that happened was Lars was on my final review for the chairs. Right. Yep. And he went nuts. He went nuts. Yeah, I can. So that's a he was the way. outside critic. Yeah. Who yep. could say anything he wants to say? Where, you know, when it's when it's part of your own family, part of when you're part of the school, everybody's mm -hmm. reserved. They don't want to go overboard with praise. <laughs> right, right. He right. did not have that. He did not have that problem. Nope. He did not have that filter. He was just going. He was effusive. He was going crazy, and so he and I bonded over that. And then, you know, three years later, he called me up and he said, hey, you know, he got the, the dean position. Yep. And was moving from uh, Berkeley. And he called me up and said, um, I want you to come teach. And I was like, OK, great. And he said, I, you know, I, he came to Houston and I took him to a couple of projects that I was working on. And he was just flipping out. And he was like, oh, you got to run the shop. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And I was like, hey, I. I also have a practice. Right. There's a limit to what I can take on, but he had all this stuff for me to do. And then crickets. Yeah. So that was like June or July and then crickets. Like what's going on here? Well, he ran into a lot of pushback from other senior faculty. Huh. You know, the yep. the established the postmodernists there did not, were not <laughs> there were there were oh yeah you know, albert was a, albert was a albert pope was a big advocate of mine yeah well and, I, yes but he wasn't the kind and, that was wearing the bow ties with the round glasses <laughs> no. and it's so weird you know like i said uh, they they kind of quarantined me isolated me in that studio it's like why it's like they didn't want the school to know what i was doing mm -hmm. and I, and then they didn't want me to have a final review. That's it was weird. very weird. Mm. And um, and Bill Sherman was my advisor. Mm -hmm. And you know Bill's great, but yeah. he's, he wasn't going to fight for me. You know, right? <clears throat> That's not his nature. So when there was this pushback about me presenting the work, <laughs> I was just like, "All right, screw it. I don't care. I'm out of here." And right, he was right. like, "No, no, 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 no. You got to. You know, we'll we'll do this." So we did have a final review and right thankfully i mean it changed my life right yeah lars was there lars asked me to teach mm -hmm. um but i was very polarizing and these were professors that i didn't even know they'd right. never taught me i never had them for a class never really spoke to them they yep. just had an opinion about me <clears throat> and apparently that's very common <clears throat> yep um so it was a really challenging situation i didn't you know, I didn't ask to be put in the middle of that, but neither did Michael. Um, no, and but we were so also we were very different. I mean, I remember everyone talking about like your studio is so different. I was like, "What do you mean you're not learning lettering every day?" I was like, "I don't need to learn lettering. <laughs> Why do I need to learn lettering? I know my handwriting sucks, but so what?" You know. <laughs> well, I, you know, because we're doing this podcast, of course, I've been looking back at that experience yeah you know what i was doing and you know if if i was teaching elementary school i would have had more training yeah as a teacher i would have had to go through some kind of teacher training when, yeah. when you're teaching at an elite university it's like hey get in there and teach like okay <laughs> how what i had no mentor right it was a really weird situation i i mean that's something that i really wish i'd had i, I wish i'd had somebody to mentor me to tell me you know kind of what this is about and how to do it because i'm not a political creature well, i was all, never in it for that <clears throat> all of these things it was interesting you know because i 
I mean, now looking back at all those years and thinking about how it was for me, you know, I was a very confused going into that school. I knew I had some knowledge and I knew I had a good problem solving skill, but I knew I was very confused about what to do in design school because I'd never actually been in design school. I went to art school. I mean, I did a little, you know, I'd had a, uh, uh, I majored in art and math, so I had both, but it was very different. And, you know, obviously critiques in, arch in architecture school were very strong. But, you know, I go in there and then all of a sudden Michael shows up and Michael, a lot of fun, but he's starting to tell me things that's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about. Because it was really hard for me to understand what he was saying. And it was like, it was like, oh, I need to educate myself more about architecture. And I started to understand a little bit more about it. But it was really, it was that point. It was like, he did say some really great things. And I really appreciated everything I was learning from him. But there was a lot of things that were like, I didn't understand how to do this or how to translate my idea into a design. And you, that's when you came into me. It was most of what I learned from you was you sitting at my desk for a couple of hours. And you would do that often time. I don't know if you, know, if you remember <laughs> that, but you would sit at my desk for like two hours and like, all right, let's. You're, you're, there's something in your head and you're not figuring it, you've got some great things and you're not figuring out how to put it into a model or a drawing or whatever. And you were helping me break that down. Uh, and also, dude, like I was mentioning before, it was about crafting as well. You know, one of the things you taught me when I was fiddling to draw, because I was drawing, you know, I, you know, like I take a 4B pencil stuff and it's like, well, let's take that 4B and let's make it a seven or, you know, or, you know, seven Soft. H. No, mm. you made me draw with a seven H or, a, okay. or like a nine Precision. H pencil. And you made me draw that line like six times before it became a line. And then I started to really look, look at that line. It's like, oh, it's, it's a much prettier line because I drew it six times. So all the little problems that are in the line, I go over it and over and over again. It was the most precise hand-drawn line I've ever done because it was <laughs> drawn seven times. And it became, and it made me much more thoughtful about that line that was being drawn. And you taught me how to draw that way. And I still, still draw that way. <laughs> so, um, and it, I still remember like, you know, just really put thought into all the lines you put down. So it was a really, a, a really good a really good thing. I, I really appreciate the, 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 the having I'm glad both that I'm thrilled, thrilled to hear that you learned something from me. I, didn't <laughs> I did. <think> so. <laughs> I did. There's a lot I learned from um, you. I mean, when you think about uh, Michael and I were polar opposite. Oh, yeah. Of the spectrum, that was a good thing. <laughs> it's great. Ex except um, the way that they put us together was so competitive. You know, we were trying to occupy the same territory. Right. And they were like, they were like putting two scorpions in a box. Like, <laughs> you guys work it out. It's like, why would you do that to a new professor? <clears throat> right, right, right. And this was um, his first time you know, at Rice and, and too. Michael, <laughs> yeah, and Michael is a serious dude, man. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he's an academic, and I've never aspired to be an academic. Yeah. I was, you know, just swimming in different waters. And, you know, if I think that it worked out great. Now, Michael was um, very generous in it, and listening to my ideas and coming because we had to come up we had to design the studio ourselves between yep. us we had to agree on what are we doing mm -hmm. and find common ground and so instead of so much finding common ground we alternated so he gave me a project then i gave him a project you know mm -hmm. i supported his and vice versa yep. so i you know one of the first things we did was those objects that you had to manipulate yeah yep which is so confounding you know to, you have to really dig hard to find a way into these things and, you know, and some of them are abject failures. That's just comes with. I think it was a cube, you know? actually. Now that I think about it, David, you you had us designing a cube. It wasn't the same exact thing. It was something about a cube that we all had to design. And I remember what I did now. Oh, my God. That's all these memories are flying back. I remember specifically mm -hmm. what I did is because I kind of sucked at modeling and I had all these failures around me, I had all of this basswood that is all these scraps of basswood everywhere. And I kept them because of like it, this basswood's kind of expensive. So I'm going to keep it somehow. I'm going to turn it into something. <laughs> right. And yeah. so I took all this basswood and I made a cube uh, out of, out of uh, chipboard. And then I took the basswood and I, connected the cube with like made all these touch points around the cube that goes around it and then i Hold removed the chipboard kind of. i made it remove the chipboard and so the cube represented the void 
that was the inside yeah. there. And it was kind of like, oh, well, that was fun. An aha moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we also did the, the common objects, like tools. I think it was a tool. You had to pick a tool or something like that. Yes. And you had to manipulate it, transform it in some yeah. way. Yeah. I think Somebody I did a, a an espre- I did an espresso machine. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, like really, really hard hard one like yeah. i didn't know what to do with that one um, <laughs> some, somebody did a hammer yeah seg- segmented it and then reassembled it with hinges yes it was that was art that was beautiful yeah and trying to somebody, use a hammer that has took hinges. a shoe somebody took a shoe and did like a you know frog dissection yes that was really cool too. I, the hammer i think was carrie whitehead who did that one i think yeah. she did that one yeah and then we also yeah, did the cool other thing pro- about who was in that studio. Yeah. There's some, some pretty high powered people in that yeah. studio. Yeah. Nicola, who's now like a vice president at <laughs> in, is there, and Carrie, and then Larry Albert. Uh, yeah, a lot of people that went on to teach yourself. Yeah. Um, and Keith, Keith Kosky, wasn't yeah. he in? That's, yeah. It was a great group. And you guys, it wasn't easy for you to, to negotiate that, to navigate through what you were in in for especially as an incoming student that's hard enough to kind of get your footing it was 14 of us i mean that's the thing that was kind of amazing about rice is that if you think about a class that's coming into grad school and there's only 14 of you and you got two professors and you got two (laughs) professors right and they're both both the professors are young right you were both 32 there wasn't a hierarchy it wasn't like one of us was the assistant in fact keith kosky was older than both of you guys (laughs) right right. and so but yeah it was like it was like and the way i looked at it i was like look at all of us we're all different and unusual students it almost felt like we were at a reality show like the way like cast us for a reality show so yeah 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 yeah. that's the way andy andy put your studio together right andy was still involved he might have uh, he might have yeah admissions but the, the whole idea of that program was to put together 12 or 14 students from from diverse backgrounds right where everybody had knew a lot about something but maybe nothing about architecture right and some people did you know had art history degrees and you know right architecture history degrees they knew way more <laughs> i didn't know anything mm-hmm. um you know that's another thing is i came into that program with zero experience i had i was an artist i wasn't i didn't have any art history background or i was just kind of self-taught and had worked at an illustrator and that kind of stuff i was always an artist growing up um but I had no formal training and I didn't know anything about architecture history or anything. And I get kind of thrust into that environment where that's all the stuff you need to know. Right. For, for one thing, it was fantastic to be introduced to art history. I just loved it. Loved it. Yeah. Um, to be introduced at that point in my life was such a you know revelation. Um, architecture, not so much. I mean, it's so funny. I was going through old drawers and files recently and found Andy's handout original handout for this is what you know the studio is this is these are the tools and equipment you're going to need for day one Mm -hmm. and basically giving you a reading list i never read those books i still haven't read any of those books right i i try and i can't um i love to read but i don't uh i don't read fast and Mm -hmm. i kind of savor what i read and I like to enjoy it. If it's technical, I kind of read the same sentence over and over. And I just don't like architectural writing. I mean, right. it, it, maybe somebody could show me something that is engaging, but I just trying to force feed that stuff. I just couldn't do it. So it right. really put me in this weird position where I had no experience and I was sort of designing intuitively. And then it's like, okay, you need to come and teach and no direction on how to be a teacher or anything like that and also i'm in this environment where it's academia the you know your rhetoric is the currency Mm -hmm. so i was in a really weird position where i had very little confidence and also a lot of confidence and it's kind of the things i had confidence in weren't really valued you know they didn't fit that system right at the same time they were recognized as something i mean it, uh, the people that talk about making always envy the makers right 
you know, it, when it comes down to it, it's about the things you make, not right. the things you say about those things, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, without those things, there's nothing to talk about. Mm -hmm. So that first year teaching your studio, I mean, I just wish I could go back now and have yeah. that experience again. I would be a different person. And it's so funny to hear your experience with Michael, because I thought you and Michael, like, 100 percent connected and resonated like he i did i love i mean <laughs> i love talking to him but it was just like i didn't understand what he was talking yeah. about and yeah. it would, took a long time and then i got it and he and i really did get along um you know it's funny i ran into him uh and it wasn't it was a couple of years ago actually i was at uh i was at tesla uh, at uh, their design headquarters and i talked to those guys there and then suddenly i see at the reception waiting for my <laughs> i see a reception i see it's like that looks like I Michael know that guy. Bell. <clears throat> and so I go and I hear his voice and it's like, that's totally, and I go up to him and it's like, excuse me, are you Michael Bell? And he goes, yeah, I was listening to you. I, you look real familiar too. I said, I was your, you know, uh, one of your students at Rice University, first year at Rice. And he goes, right you're the guy who was always using the computers <laughs> yeah it's like yep that was me and he goes i remember you and i was like yeah and so i talked to him so yeah it was funny it was and um tom main has been there too because tom main apparently they're michael and tom have been helping with the design process at tesla apparently so i don't know what they're doing but uh it's great it's great it's very cool i mean I, I wish that i had if i could do it again what i would do in those crits sitting at your desk i would be listening i'd be Plumbing the depths. I, um, you, I, you did. Like, you spent you spent hours with me at my desk because I remember us very much. Michael was having a hard time communicating what he was trying to communicate to me. He knew something was there, and then I think you helped me figure it out. And I think what we ended up doing. I remember what the project was. The project was we had to represent some great piece of architecture, right? And uh, I think Carrie was doing the, uh, the Palladio or, or which the the. the What's the famous little um, Italian, what do you call it? Uh, the, uh, anyway, I decided to do um, Frank Gehry's uh, Vitra Design Museum. And uh, because similar to you, I just sort of fell in love with deconstructivism at that time. I just thought it was amazing. Um, and so I was looking at how the hell am I going to build this? And you were telling me, it's like, well, it's not just about building it. You have to learn something about it. And so we were learning about it. And I was looking at all the pictures and understanding about it. And I said, the problem I always had with this building is that, or not the problem, is that the problem with the building is that people always see it from the outside as a, as a sculpture. <laughs> And they, Objects, don't yeah. and they don't see the beauty of the inside of it because the beauty of the inside is so hard to understand because it's so deconstructed, right? You have uh, to experience it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, I, you and I discussed that for a long time and, and, and then figure it out. And then that's when I decided to build the entire thing inside out. I don't know if you remember when I, I did that. But basically, I took a piece of plywood and I did a... We were, you, I was trying to figure out, like, I want to represent the inside and how to do that. And I think you were the one who has showed me, like, you ever heard of a, a reflected ceiling plan? So what we said, we did a, a 3D version of a reflected ceiling plan where you go, basically you're looking inside the building from, from above. And it was a really great idea for us to sort of, you know, brainstorm that, that, that conceptual design. That's a very, idea. very morphosis approach. Yeah. I didn't know, yeah. right? But I learned so much from that, right? So it was a really great yep. sort of idea of, of doing that. Um, um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I highly well, recommend I'm glad it. That you had a good experience. I had I a felt great. Like I, I missed an opportunity um, to engage you in a, on your level, on to learn from you. Um, I mean, I think that I, I've learned to do that much more now with yeah. students. But I think early on, I was so close. I was really young, and we were all you know, young. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to. Well, you have an age. But we're trying to, uh, you know, find the right distance. Yeah, the right kind of uh, uh, intimacy without being too close. And also, I had this insecurity. I mean, I, I was in this situation where everybody in the room knew more than I did, but I was the teacher. Yep. That's, a t that's a tough one. I had a couple of studios where there were students that, that rubbed my 
face in that, you know? Really? Yeah. And that, sorry, they told me to come and teach or they asked me to right. take it up with somebody else. But, you know, I, I'm not sure what I could do in that situation, but um, it's kind of taken a long time for me to, I mean, in fact, at Rice, I was never at home. Right. I never felt part of, even when I was tenure track, um, when I when they hired me tenure track, it was like this. We had this party and it was fantastic. And mm-hmm. every there was, I felt so much support. And it was the atmosphere is like about time, you know. Right. This is great. But it quickly dissipated, dissolved, and I just felt like I was always on the outside looking in. Mm. And um, I didn't speak the same language. And you know, I'm here to develop my voice, my point of view, not to try to fit into something else that's not doesn't come natural to me so much effort to try to do that and then what do you end up being i mean there's already somebody else who is that naturally why sh- you know right i just wanted to be me and yeah. they kind of uh, took me aside and gave me a warning and i you know there was politics there was an undercurrent of politics yeah. going on and um, there was there was one person in particular that just never wanted me to be on the faculty, hmm. and he's pretty Machiavelli. knew knew how to wait, you know, for his opportunity to take me out. <laughs> and mm-hmm. anyway, they kind of pulled me aside and they said, you know, you, your studios need to do this or that. And I've been doing the same thing for fifteen years. It's like, is there a problem with? Nobody's ever said, I can see the work. Everybody can see the work coming mm-hmm. out of the studios. Yep. It's, there's a problem. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, I was sort of given a warning. <laughs> and mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, I better play by the rules here. Mm-hmm. Well, Katrina had come through and um, I had gone back and forth to New Orleans to really, I didn't trust the kind of media accounts of what reality was so I took trips over there and really explored uh, the Ninth Ward all of that stuff and you know that was weighing heavily on me I really wanted to do something with New Orleans and I was mm-hmm. really kind of offended at the, the architecture architectural community's response to that situation which was to have design competitions and turn it into a self-promotion <laughs> yep uh opportunity where it's like just doing designer stuff for new orleans it's like that it has nothing to do with new orleans it has nothing to do with a solution to what the real problems are you don't even know what the problems are how are right. you proposing a solution so the next fall after i've been kind of told i needed to uh toe the line i i proposed a studio that was research and it's like we're gonna before we pr- before we presume to have an answer or propose an answer, it was a housing project for New Orleans. Before mm-hmm. we propose an answer, let's make sure we know what the problem is. Let's have the right questions first. Right. And maybe the semester it's going to be entirely research. Maybe we won't get to a point where we do a proposal. Um, and I'm okay with that if that's where it goes. And so I have, I think, eight students mm-hmm. sign up for that. And it was so much fun. It was just a blast and it was sort of like the international studio we had a right f- t- student from korea from china from mexico um a, a guy from well he's Amer he's born in america but his recent roots were kenya he had a right. deep interest in reconnecting with kenya and so we had this really um uh, this frank guitar there were some great people in that studio and i decided i'm going to run this studio like an office so everybody's going to have their own area of research and I'm just going to kind of direct it. Right. And it was great. I mean, we had, uh, anyway, we produced a book and the book was called N- NOLA Macroscape. And then the next semester I did uh, a vertical studio, an undergrad studio. So that's juniors and seniors combined. And we were going to do a guitar factory. And d- do you know, Collings guitars out of Austin. Mm -mm. So uh, Bill Collings uh, passed away, unfortunately, from cancer recently, a few years ago. Okay. Um, But he's a world renowned guitar maker and based in Austin, like virtually everybody who's anybody has at least one of his guitars. 
okay you know you name it pete towns i mean you you name it they have this collings guitars and one of my good friends um is a general contractor and he built the, the new factory so they had built up from nothing in this sort of ramshackle accreted thing and had reached a level of success where they were going to build a state-of-the-art factory so i had access to the drawings to the, the facility and the process and everything so it was like the perfect to me that's the perfect design project for juniors and seniors mm-hmm. <clears throat> so there's so many levels you can address the the process and fabrication and construction and order math music um, and I so I had this idea I was going to do that in the spring and one day in the fall I, so I was in front of my house up in the front yard and somebody called out my name and this guy was walking by and he was like hey are you david and i said yeah and he said well i'm steven i live down the street and he knew well, he wasn't an architecture student but he knew somebody who i had taught we mm-hmm. had a mutual friend and he said i'm a luthier and he lives like five houses down from me and i'm like wow um i'm doing a guitar factory studio next semester would you be interested in getting involved and he was like yeah so Stephen marchioni is a world-class luthier mm-hmm. his guitars are thirty five thousand dollars or oh my gosh more he's he's like the real deal the luthier is an instrument maker like a violin maker or guitar maker right so i have off and on played guitar since i was a teenager mm-hmm. i never knew anything about them mm-hmm. i also didn't know anything about music Right. I'm, I'm starting to hear myself hear a theme here. Like I do yeah. all these things that I do not, don't really know anything about. <clears throat> right. Um, but anyway, we um, we embarked on this studio and it was sort of like the Wood Institute competition where you can't start the, the project because it's the Watkin Prize. There was a schedule that you had to adhere to. Mm-hmm. So the first couple of weeks were pre pre-designed. So we could do research and analysis, but not actually start the project. So I brought him in and we um, made a single string instrument. And it okay. was a, it was a, you know, so they had to make the frets just like the nut and the bridge um, and a tuning key, just a piece of wood. They could do anything they wanted. and. I'd had very low expectations. It was just like a, a sign on Friday, do on Monday project. Yep. I was blown away. These things were amazing. Mm-hmm. So we were like, okay, maybe we should do a three string instrument. Cause then you have a triad, you have a chord, you can actually make music. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time we were doing a lot of analysis, uh, instrument analysis, the proportional studies and all of that. And I was just blown away by what, what I was learning that uh, the, the iconic instruments like the Stratocaster, the, I mean, the electric guitars, or even the acoustic instruments, um, all of these beautiful iconic designs are just infused with proportions that um, are, are easily analyzed. They're not uh, subjective. <laughs> right. And, and they come from the proportions of uh, the musical scale. And so all this stuff was super interesting and, you know, like how does music work and how can that kind of be translated into an idea of architecture of proportionality and rhythm and repetition, right. structures of things. Um, we got a little further down this path and I was like, you know, what is the most reasonable instrument that we could make? And so Stephen and I brainstorm and came up with the mandolin. Okay. A guitar. It's just a question of real estate. Um, these are hand carved. And I, this is something I didn't know. Do you know what an arch top guitar is? Mm-mm. It has a, has a bow on the top. Okay. It's curvilinear, right? Like a violin. A violin has yes, a topography. Yes, yes, yes. Right? It's not just flat. That, I, I thought that was like, um molded you know like an eames chair yeah yeah, yeah right no it's carved okay. so you take a slab of wood and you carve that topography and then you do the the back side and you have to do it in a way that you don't cut all the way through 
right. and, and also make it so thin that it resonates, um, but not so thin that it collapses or breaks. But anyway, we, um, we hit on this idea of doing a mandolin because it's small. Mm -hmm. A guitar is, a, it's a lot of mm -hmm. carving. It takes forever. It's so much more work. Right. And it's all a question of hours, you know, just what it takes to carve that many more square inches or square feet of material. Yeah. So we put it to a vote, sat all the students around. We had 11 students. We sat them around a table and said, OK, um, I have this idea. What if we made a real instrument? What if we made a mandolin? It may take up the whole semester. We may not do a project like a standard project we may not do the factory we may run out of time mm -hmm. but who's down for that and it was a hundred percent raised hands they mm -hmm. all wanted to do it so off we went <clears throat> and it was so cool um to kind of re-envision reimagine the studio the mm -hmm. design studio and steven wasn't paid wasn't officially recognized by the school or anything he came to every studio session right three days a week brought his tools and he he taught step by step how to do this so right. they built their instruments from scratch um the only thing that that we bought was the the necks the blank necks okay. so they had like a generic headstock just like a slab you know rectangle so right. they got to design their their headstock but they had to fret the necks they had to cut the necks to length and mount the necks hmm. but the rest of it they built from scratch so they bought slabs of wood they had to split the wood to make it book match glue those up carve the you know right. carve everything they had to to bend the sides they had to plane the, the thickness down to like a little more than a sixteenth of an inch less than an eighth of an inch and then he, with a heat bender bend the sides and glue everything up <clears throat> It was just amazing. So I, I was the design critic, and he was the technical yeah. instructor. And one of the things that I said, uh, we're going to get rid of everything that's not essential in this room. All of your crap from last semester's out of here. All of it gone. So we just, I ran it like they ran the machine shop when I did my chairs. Like mm -hmm. the guy was from the Navy and everything had to be absolutely ship shape or you didn't come back. If you left a mess, that was your last time in the shop. Yep. So, and everything had to be put black or long because those tooling, if you can't find your tooling, you can spend all day looking for the right bit or something. So everything had to stay organized and neat. And so that's what we did with the studio. It's like everything that's not necessary that doesn't apply to what you're actually doing, get it out of here. And we're going to clean the studio every day. We're going to sweep the floors every day. And so we did most of the work in the studio. Hmm. There was some work that was done down in the shop, but they each built their own kind of work board that would hold the instrument while they worked on it. And um, most of the work was actually done in the studio. And it hmm. was just unbelievable. It was such an amazing experience. And I was sort of the documentarian. I just photographed and videoed kind of constantly mm -hmm. so i have a lot of documentation of this and then we did some really nice photo documentation of the final product mm. um but that was the last thing that i taught at rice it did not go over <laughs> they were like we don't do that here <clears throat> right right that's a shame and it was really weird because um we connected with this website called mandolin cafe mm-hmm so you know, as you can imagine, there's a bubble for everything. And sure. so there's a huge world of mandolin that like, unless you're in that world, you don't know about it. Right. And early on, we found this website and that was just the epiphany. That was just like pff, mind blown. Any, the, the beauty of the mandolin as opposed to something like the, um, the violin is freedom, hmm. design freedom. So, the mandolin is basically a violin. It's the same string length, same tuning. It has twice as many strings or doubled up. Like, um, has the same basic volume, same scale length. So, you know, for a, you're basically making a, a violin. 
either make a violin or you don't. Mm -hmm. It's such a tradition that it's it leaves no room for creativity. But what we found out with the mandolin was you can do anything you want because nobody owns it, nobody cares. There's no tradition. And when we found this website, we found that every imaginable guitar has been turned into a mandolin. Hmm. Double neck flying V is a mandolin. All these electric mandolins. Yeah. Um, you know, Les Paul, Telecaster, Stratocaster, everything has been turned into the mandolin scale. Interesting. And then you look at acoustic mandolins. Um, that you can do anything you want. There's some beautiful, beautiful things out there. So that really inspired us, inspired the students, and they just took off. So we ended up with 11 unique instruments that were all successful. Um, word had kind of spread through the campus. A couple of people, or at least one of the students in the studio, had a roommate. He was in the Shepherd School, the music school. Mm -hmm. So word had kind of spread through campus. So when we had our final review, first we had a like a roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm. And then it just turned into a jam session. And we had people from every department in the university there. Hmm. Just to be part of it. And, to, and the students were, you know, these things are, they've had so many hours and in suffering invested in these things. It's hard work. There were so many blisters. Yeah. Sore shoulders. It's, it's, it's hard. And um, also they're fragile. It's every, every step of the process of making these things is potentially catastrophic right it risks everything you've done before imagine working on cg and knowing that if you make the wrong move it's going to erase the whole thing right how it's terrifying yeah, yeah i yeah. was terrified i tried not to show it because the students didn't show any fear at all right but i was like oh my god so even think about the last step the last step is when you tune it right so that's when you're I think it's 200 pounds of string tension. And this is a delicate, fragile, it's an eighth of an inch at the thickest and half of that, the thinnest. And you're going to load that up with 200 pounds of tension. It really wants to just implode. Right. You don't know what you have this whole time. You've invested all this time and you don't know if you have something or not until you put the strings on and tighten them. Yeah. And and it survives and the structure and of it too <laughs> that's what i mean yeah, it is yeah, a yeah. structural thing and it in the 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 reason why i believed in it so strongly as a belonging in the architecture curriculum is because it is structure mm -hmm. and it's and it's also minimum structure it's kind of like bucky fuller's ultimate goal right. which is infinite span zero mass right. and or zero weight whatever and so you're making these delicate things that resonate and you put bracing in them very strategically so it doesn't kill the resonance. Right. But it also is structurally sound. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, I was looking forward to doing more, doing like a percussion studio right. and involving the studio, kind of recruiting. I wanted to have more cross-pollination. I could see the potential across campuses that all these silos don't communicate and it's like man what are we doing you know you leave here and then you wish you could talk to those people right and collaborate and there's so much room there's so much potential to, to collaborate but people are protective of their turf and yeah. scared to to take those risks yeah so that was the the end of my my uh tenure at rice and um and then it was a long time before i taught again i just didn't want to do it for a long time and yeah uh, well it's a shame because you were a great teacher i honestly thought it was it was a very interesting and i thought honestly you know yes it was clear that both you and michael were thrown into that situation we it was very interesting but i i took it to benefit right i took the i took the best out of both of you <laughs> to figure out how to get to where yeah. i wanted to go so that's what i wanted to good do. for you there, yeah. I mean, there was there was that opportunity yeah it's interesting the last couple of years because of probably because of the mandolin studio i mean even though that was you know more than 10 years ago mm -hmm. um well a couple of things one is when those things were done those students had their confidence was sky high right they were way more skilled than i was than i am right they one of them, we crossed paths in the hallway one day and, and he said, hey, we stopped and he said, hey, 
you know, I feel like I can do anything. It's like, yeah, you can. I mean, right. look. I would walk in and find these pieces that they'd made, like an ebony bridge or tailpiece, just gorgeous. Like, where did you get this? I made it. Like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's amazing. <clears throat> so I would really, I mean, one of the things that I thought also thought validated it was, you know, they bought little cases for their instruments. It's right. Like if, if a student, a, a, a recent graduate, walked into my office for an interview and dropped that on my desk, I'd hire them in a heartbeat. Right. Like, okay, this tells me so much. Right. Um, not only is it an original design, but the execution of it, the skill, the discipline, the s wow. Mm. Okay, you're. <laughs> I can use you somehow. Right. So I would really, I really am trying now to circle back around and get in touch with those students and um, find out. That would be an interesting podcast. Yeah. Like how did that? How did that influence you? Yeah. How did That'd that change great. your path? <clears throat> For sure. For sure. Well, listen, David, I actually have to get going soon, but I really appreciate yeah. you uh, giving the time to, to do this and great stories about design and your influences and your philosophy, because I think that's something that has always been very interesting to me. So I'm really happy to do that. Congratulations on starting the company and, and you know, doing the masks, which is incredible as well. Um, and all the great things you've been doing. So it's awesome to do this. And, and I definitely look, and definitely look forward to hearing about your podcast. Have you come up with a name yet for your podcast or not yet? Are you still thinking, brainstorming? Well, that one? When, I was thinking of, when I was thinking about swimming, I wanted to call it There's More to Swimming Than Life. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but now I want to talk about more things. I don't want to get pigeonholed yeah. into one subject. And that's something that maybe we'll talk about uh, okay. later. It's like, sure. you know, how do you, how do you kind of, frame it so that you don't get stuck because there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about yeah yeah for sure or you can have um, different podcasts I have different I have two podcasts <laughs> so, okay so you can do that too <laughs> but thank you so much and I yeah. hope somebody gets something out of it I yeah know, oh, I'm sure they will I know they will just talking I know I have so I know other people will as well <laughs> man I've enjoyed the heck out of it and yeah. spending time with you this is um, yeah, it's just such a such a privilege. I really appreciate it. It's fun, right? It's a lot of fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fun to listen to them too when they're good. That's so going to be good. Hopefully, this is one of those. All right. Well, thank you, David. 